My name is Ryan Long. I'm a volunteer attorney with the Electronic Frontera Foundation, in addition to being a non-resident fellow of Stanford Law School's Center for Internet Society. I run my own law practice between New York and Los Angeles, representing technology, media, and design companies with their litigation, intellectual property, and corporate matters. I think the best way to understand blockchain is to use an analogy and the best way that I like to understand it and explain to people that don't know about blockchain is to use a poem, uh, it's called Where the Sidewalk Ends, and it's by Shaul Silverstein. So if you take a poem and the author of the poem, that's a very simple concept, right? I sit and write the poem, uh, I put up in a Word document, that's a simple concept. Then you start with that and you go to the second step which is I'm working on the poem and then I want you to work on it with me. So what I do is I put it up on Google Docs and you and I have both have access to Google Docs. And if you haven't worked on Google Docs before, for anybody listening, think of Google, Google Docs as a, as a small ledger where you can keep track of changes to the poem or to a document. So when I make a change, it shows up in one color and when you make a change, it shows up in another color. So we keep track of the changes to the poem that way. So now if you extrapolate from that situation of Google Docs and instead of two people working on the poem, you have millions of people, that's an, an, what's called an open source network. So we're adding to the poem, we're subtracting from it, and initially the poem would be one page. But then as more people add to the poem, it keeps growing. Blockchain works in a similar way, in that you start with one block, and then you go to a second block and a third block, and it run, the blocks run consecutively. So one, two, three, four, five, whatever the numbers are. And then instead of filling those blocks with a poem, you fill them with a transaction. So I might do a deal with you uh, for a certain amount of Bitcoin, which is a form of cryptocurrency. So I exchange X amount of Bitcoin with you, you exchange X amount of Bitcoin with me, and on each block there will be numerous transactions of Bitcoin. So you can think of blockchain as basically a digital ledger that is publicly available, in, in the case of public blockchains, where people can keep track of what transactions are going on and between who. Uh, the difference in the poem example is that you know who I am, I know who you are. With blockchain, each person that does a transaction with Bitcoin will have basically a hash, a digital hash. So I think a, a good thing to think of in terms of a digital hash is if I take my fingerprint, I would get a hash for my fingerprint. It was, it's, and my fingerprint's pretty idiosyncratic. It's, nobody else has my fingerprint. So the same thing with my hash for my ID. When you do a transaction on the blockchain in Bitcoin, my, my Bitcoin would be sent to your hash uh, and our trans transaction would be between hashes. So this thing keeps going. Uh, the difference between a blockchain and the poem is that generally poems end. So if you think of the poem where the sidewalk ends and it keeps going forever, that's a blockchain. It just keeps building on each other. So there's different types of blockchains. Uh, I think most people think of a blockchain, some people think of a blockchain as like a pearl necklace or a chain. Uh, I just went over what a blockchain is in terms of the cryptocurrency world. And the example I gave with Google Docs, well that's uh, generally speaking to be on Google Docs you have to have a password, you have to be, you have to have gain access to it. So the analogy between blockchain and Google Docs would be more apt if you took a public Google Docs where actually anybody could join that network. That's a purely public blockchain where basically the ledger which, which is, is public and it shows the transactions between my hash and your hash, everybody can see that. Uh, there is a consortium blockchain which can be thought of as like 10 banks working on a blockchain together. That's m more private. Uh, that's, I guess you can call it semi-private and there's a completely private blockchain. So there's at least three types and there's different blockchains developing all the time. So I think the purpose of this is really to give an overview of the technology so that people listening to this will leave the, the, the talk with uh, more of an understanding of the relationship between blockchain and Bitcoin. I think it's interesting from a legal perspective because generally transactions, 
that are happen in a, in, a, in a dollar currency or in, in a Chinese currency or whatever currency you're talking about, you can see what's going on. You can see the amount of money. Uh, you can see the tr people who are transacting in the deal. Uh, I think from a legal perspective, the difference is that with with, uh, with blockchain and Bitcoin, uh, you can't see who the parties are. Uh, it's a new currency. There's no uh, nobody uh, basically guaranteeing its value. In the United States, for the dollar, for instance, there's a Federal Reserve Bank, which uh, is behind the dollar. So in Bitcoin, there's nothing really behind Bitcoin. It's as if I picked up a chair and said, this, this chair is worth so much. And then you and I started using the chair to do a transaction. And I think from a legal perspective, it gets more difficult as you have a company, let's for instance, there's Bitcoin arbitrage companies that trade Bitcoin between China uh, and Korea or what different countries uh, based upon the different values. As you scale that company, it becomes larger. It gets harder if I'm general counsel of a company to basically regulate or have uh, basic, uh, terms and conditions that people have to abide by and to police them. Because if you imagine somebody trading in a currency like Bitcoin and they're doing it through a hash, they might have different hashes. I mean, it becomes more complicated and more difficult to pierce that transparent, pierce that anonymity, and understand what's going on on the bottom level. I think regulation and its effect on blockchain technology will be a very interesting thing in the coming years. Uh, I think that the difficult part is that. If you compare blockchain to the traditional financial market, which is I go buy stock on the, on the uh, publicly traded stock exchange in New York, uh, you're a publicly traded company, there's rules that regulate what companies can say about their stock. So if I'm issuing stock on the publicly traded exchange, I can't misrepresent my stock and say, or my product and say, I have a patent on this product. It was issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, uh, and you should buy my stock because we're going to make a lot of money with this monopoly. Meanwhile, I got a letter from the United States Patent and Trademark Office saying there's problems with my patent. It's probably going to be revoked. That is arguably securities fraud. So I think that in that instance, it's easy to regulate what's going on because I'm making public statements to the public or public statements. Uh, soliciting my stock to people, saying, hey, this is why you should buy the stock, uh, so on and so forth. I think that regulation of Bitcoin in terms of fraud is very difficult because a lot of these contracts use these uh, uh, these te technological contracts uh, and they're basically, it's code. So I go, I want to buy a certain amount of Bitcoin, uh, let's say it's an option contract, it, that's, a code, that's, that's a coded contract, and there's no negotiation. I just put my, I put my request in, uh, and I want to buy so much Bitcoin at a certain price or a certain date, it locks me in, and then I get my Bitcoin. It's kind of like going to a vending machine. So who programs these transactions, um, I think, is one issue. I think the representations made of what I'm getting uh, is another thing, and I think that the dif difficulty is that because it is decentralized, it's harder to it's harder to regulate it. I mean, from a centralized perspective, in the in the securities fraud context, you have the Securities Exchange Commission. They regulate what people say. So, in the blockchain context, it's it's kind of amorphous as who regulates what. I think that's a great question. Uh, I think we're on the way to doing that. Whether or not code replaces law, I think is is it will replace a lot of contracts and a lot of negotiation between parties that lawyers will otherwise do. I think that when you get to more complicated con trans transactions, it might not, but somebody has to write the code. So my view is that even if you have completely coded transactions that are uh, uh, completely virtual and digital, you still need somebody that knows the legal concepts to write that code. And a coder can't do it if they don't know uh, force majeure, which is an act of God that comes in and makes the performance of the contract impossible. Uh, and the issue with writing transactions in code is that in order for the transaction to be enforced in a court of law, there needs to be somebody that interprets that code. So you would need to have a judge versed in the type of code that you're writing. Otherwise, writing code is, 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 won't be able to be enforced in a court. So there's a, trans, there's a translation issue between the lawyer writing the code, so I would need to be working with a coder and say, we're going to put the code here, this is what this means, and then we would need to have a, a kind of a, a translation model or translation method so that all the code can be translated into English, and that would be basically back to square one, which is having a contract. So I don't know, I don't know how much this stuff will become digitized without having some type of relationship to traditional legal concepts.
So it's a good question whether or not Bitcoin and cryptocurrency can be used for money laundering. The, I think a big distinction needs to be made between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. They're not made, all made equal. I think that people need to understand that there's different blockchains. So I think when somebody asks that question, can, crypto, can Bitcoin be used for money laundering, they should understand what Bitcoin is, the differences between Bitcoin and other digital currencies, and also whether or not Bitcoin is being used on a public blockchain or private blockchain. So, but generally speaking, there is the Silk Road trial that happened, I, I don't recall the exact date, but it was pretty recent in the United States. You guys can Google it or watching this. Uh, and you can see that the US government seized, I don't know the exact, it's in my notes, but let's say $80 million of Bitcoin. Uh, don't quote me guys on this, but there's a certain pretty hefty amount of Bitcoin that was seized uh, in the Silk Road case. So, and, that, and the allegation of the government is that Silk Road was being used to transact in, in weapons, uh, drugs, I mean, you name it, it was like the whole kitchen sink. So I think to say that digital currency hasn't been used to money launder or to transact in goods uh, by terrorists that want to come in and do harm in the United States or what have you uh, would be naive. Uh, at the same time, to say that regular banking and traditional banking hasn't been used to money launder as well is also naive. I mean, there's clear cases of people putting funds in Switzerland and traditional banks in Switzerland. Also in Liechtenstein is the new kind of haven. Um, and I think that traditional banking has been used to money launder. So I think a more interesting question is which one is more difficult to regulate? Um, also, which one would people prefer to have their money parked in? Uh, would it be Bitcoin or having a, a bank in Switzerland? But I think to just say that cryptocurrency is worse than regular banking and is more susceptible to abuse is I don't know. I mean, it's been, it, there's been a lot of that in that world, uh, the, the traditional banking world, where banks won't divulge client lists. Um, people put their, their money in these banks and they're basically anonymous. They'll have anonymous accounts. They'll be secret accounts. So the question of whether or not Bitcoin is more dangerous, uh, I think, is still an open, uh, open for debate. I don't think it's just ipso facto worse, uh, especially given the track record of traditional banking and participating in a lot of this stuff. And this isn't just me. I've seen this by other commentators. I'm not, I'm not the original proponent of this or of this view. It's just what, from my understanding of the market. Well, I think it depends on the blockchain you're using. If you're using blockchain that is a private blockchain and you're using hashes that are not, there's no keys to the hashes, I think it becomes harder. I think that it's analogous to having a bank that's a private bank in Switzerland and all of the accounts are anonymous and they won't divulge the information. So whether or not blockchain can be used, uh, if, if you can use blockchain to make it more transparent depends on the type of blockchain and the type of currency that you're using. So that would be my, my impression. I think there's a lot of positive things to blockchain that are being not seen by traditional uh, banks. Uh, I think one application is facilitating open source development between pharmaceutical companies. The big issue between ph pharmaceutical companies is they develop something in secret. Uh, they're so afraid of it getting out before they file their patent. And the way that you, this works is once I file a patent, I have to disclose my technology and its uses to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So if you imagine companies that have relationships together and they're able to work on transactions of information, and that information would be represented by a hash. So if I have a certain amount of, uh, let's say I have a study and I wanted to protect it, I would apply the algorithm to the study. Let's say it's a 100 page, 100 page study, a bunch of words. I apply the algorithm to those words, to that 100 page study, as with the poem. Uh, the poem can be represented in a hash. I take that poem where the sidewalk ends, I apply the algorithm, and then that poem will be represented by an idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic hash. So the same thing with trade, uh, ch exchanging information. If I'm one pharmaceutical company and I want to exchange information with you, we can do, instead of a Bitcoin transaction, we do an exchange of information. And then on your end, you, you unpack what I send to you by when you open up your wallet, if you will, 
and you're able to see the results of my study. So it's a very good way, I think, of transacting between companies that want to keep things confidential. I think it's a very positive thing that can be harnessed. I think with any technology, there's negatives. Is with a gun. You know, a gun can be used to, for heinous, horrible things, or it can be used to protect yourself or for fun. A knife, I mean, there's different things. Uh, the internet, you can use it to snoop on people legally, or you can use it to connect with your friends and family. So I think sometimes blockchain is being demonized uh, because people don't realize the positive purposes. So with respect to pharmaceuticals, you can imagine an open source network, a consortium of pharmaceutical companies, and they exchange information on the blockchain, uh, and they're able to see what is going on with other, everybody else in the consortium. And of course, they would have agreements between them concerning confidentiality that can be exchanged on the blockchain as well. So I think it would be a big innovator uh, for companies that want to work with other companies, but have hitherto not done that because of confidentiality concerns. Um, if I email Bristol Myers and I'm at uh, some other pharmaceutical company, it, whatever I email, if I send an attachment, we know now from email, uh, your emails can be hacked. I mean, it's very hard to stay private on once you're on the internet. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I think can facilitate uh, collaboration between companies and lead to better uh, drugs for people that will help them uh, with serious ailments. It's a great question, and I think my impression is that you have to look at Napster. Napster existed where I would, it's a file sharing network. I would, I would have, let's say, Jimi Hendrix all on the Watchtower. You would have Bob Dylan, uh, whatever song, I don't know what your favorite Bob Dylan song is, but whatever Bob Dylan song you have, and then we would exchange them uh, on Napster. Um, I think that the recording industry of America fell behind when they went after Napster and didn't license that technology, which is digital music, uh, and harness it to basically lower the price of music. And now music sales have, hurt, have been hurt. Um, I think that one way to facilitate creativity is you can use the hash for a song. So if you and I are working on a song together, it's same with the pharmaceutical in, in, in a context. We can exchange information confidentiality com in a confidential way about what we're working on in terms of creative endeavors. Uh, or if we're creating a compilation and we don't want anybody to rip it off before it's done, um, we can, instead of using other encryption methods, the blockchain technology can be used to encrypt what I'm sending. So if I have a song, or let's say I have a million songs, I can basically apply the algorithm that people use to create these hashes, and that can have a lot of data stored in the one hash, and then you can unpack it on your side. So it can be, it'd be very helpful to helping people develop uh, better products, better music. Uh, it's not just for hackers and people who are anarchists, which I've heard some people say.